circa 1990. It's your boy Yvonne. And I'm Ladante. We are the founders and managing partners of New Age Capital, an early stage venture capital firm investing in dope tech startups founded and led by black and Latino entrepreneurs. We've known each other for mm, 10 years now. And over the last decade, we've made it through college. We turned up, we traveled, survived corporate America, and started a couple companies together, ultimately leading us to where we are today. New Age Capital is the culmination of our passion for entrepreneurship, coupled with our deep frustration with the lack of venture capital invested in black and Latino communities. Also, there was really no venture brand out there that connected with us on the cultural and interpersonal level. So we decided to create something dope that was authentic to our lifestyles. Little did we know, <laughs> raising a fund is hard as No, but seriously though, raising a fund? It's hard as But we still out here though. So on our journey to build a new age capital, we decided to highlight some of the amazing entrepreneurs we met along the way. This is Chopping It Up. Today, we're talking to Micah Brown. Micah is the founder and CEO of Sentiment the first brain-powered analytics company in the marketing and advertising space. Sentiment is building tools capable of true representational understanding of human thought within AI, with an application to advertising, to ensure that as more forms of deep and machine learning are developed, they are done so with the least amount of bias as possible. Now, let's take a look at some AI. The term artificial intelligence was first coined in 1956 at Dartmouth University. Over the last two decades, there has been immense advancement in AI and machine learning. With projects like Google Brain and IBM's Watson, we are now getting glimpses of the power of machine learning and artificial intelligence. CB Insights reported that in 2017, AI startups raised $15 billion, tackling everything from healthcare to commerce to energy, and it doesn't stop there. Within the advertising and marketing industry, ads will only become more targeted and specific as one day we may start seeing ads that adapt to our reactions. Let's go chat with Micah to find out what the future holds for sentiment. All right, so we got our British brother Micah in the building today, man. Good Thanks for coming, man. man. How you Long doing? Time see you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, talk, for, uh, Thanks for coming through. Um, so, you know, uh, inaugural season of chopping it up. Thank you for being a, a, a guest on here. You've been you've been knowing us for a while now. Been rocking out with us, um, and uh, you know we love everything about you, your energy, what you've been building. Um, and honestly, you know you're one of you know the most intellectual um, people that we know. So we always love engaging with you. So um, thanks for joining us, man, to share your story. You know about your come up, a lot of the struggles you went through, and um, you know you building this awesome AI company called Sentiment. Yeah, man. Definitely. I mean, where's the best place to start? What do you want to... Um, so, uh, you know, let's let's take it back. Let's take sure. it back to, uh, you know, uh, back to the UK days. Yeah. You know, talk, talk to us about, you know, what do you want the world to know about? Like, who is Micah Brown? I mean, I don't know if you've if you seen Westworld, this latest episode of Westworld. Oh, Westworld. Westworld made it, right? So, like, in the final episode, we find out... Spoiler alert. I haven't, yeah, I haven't oh. seen the final episode. Okay. Interesting things happen in the final episode. <laughs> okay. And the conclusion from that is very simple. As human beings, are actually quite simple, right? You, you can take humans and look at their core drives. And like for me, my core drives, I have only three really. One is basically to look after other people, and I'll get into why that is from my upbringing in a second. And the other is to discover new things. And the other is to always remain authentic and truthful. So like, those are my core drives. And it like sounds- that. We like that. That's who I am as a person, bro. Like, yeah. it sounds simple, but to maintain those core drives through the journey that I've had, it's been a challenging journey, right? Right. And um, those are my core drives. And it starts from, you know, I grew up in South London, a place called Catford. Like, if anyone doesn't know, Catford is like, um, it's a great place. It's an amazing place. It's one of the centers of black culture in, in uh, South London, within Lewisham um, and Brixton and, and Peckham. And like, all those places are amazing, but it's a difficult place. Like, there's a lot of crime there. There's, there's a lot of poverty. And I grew up and I had both of these parents, amazing parents of mine, raised me really well um, in a kind of a religious environment, which was amazing. And there was all this stuff happening around us, but our lives were super structured. Like, mm -hmm. you go to church, you um, study, I would finish studying, I would do, like, I played some sports earlier on in life, and that and looking after my sister was my entire life. And right. we lived in what's called a council estate, which is kind of like a project. Um, but you would really be remiss to think that it was a suburban upbringing because, like, my actual life, despite being in that environment, was super structured and, and very heavily 
uh, productive. But yeah, it was, it was a dangerous environment growing up. People got killed, people got stabbed. Um, yes, there was, it was a challenging upbringing. You know, as you were growing up, ultimately, you know, where did you find your passion, you know, as a child and then as you got older, um, you know, and you have, you have a very eclectic mind. So, you know, talk about that a little bit and when yeah. you started to realize you were different. So I grew up in, first of all, uh, Camberwell, which is a part of South London. I lived the rest of my life in Catford. In Camberwell, uh, my parents sent me and my sister to stage school from like age five or six. I remember this very distinct play that we were doing. And in this play, like, I was really, it was a Shakespearean play, and I was really connecting with the character on the level of like, this character was abused and, and angry and all these different things. His name's Hotspur in Henry IV. And um, all of the other people in the stage school were just like technically acting out this role or seeing the roles around it. And I thought to myself, this is weird. And I remember waking up at that particular moment in this like really posh stage school in South London. Wow, I'm not the only black person here, me and my sister. And this is a stage school. This is like all the kids here, their parents send them here to learn to sing and dance and understand higher eclectic, egalitarian ways to operate in the world. And me and my sister are the only people here. But what does that mean for like, because I used to do this journey where I'd, I'd walk from, um, it was this place in Camberwell where I lived, and I'd walk to Dulwich, which is this nice part of town where the stage school was. And I just walked there. And I started becoming very aware of the journey I would take from my house to this place, from like, everything I saw there to everything I saw in this other world. And that is from that age, and then maybe that was like 11, 12, mm -hmm. I was like, wow, there is something unique about my existence in this space and bridging both of those worlds. And as that's continued as I've become an adult, like that's been the case in a lot of spaces. Right. And it's also a responsibility. Obviously, you're from the UK, but you're now in the States. So yeah. kind of talk about that journey coming overseas, you know, and what you were doing, you know, before you started. Yeah, um, yeah. So I'll compress it. But um, so essentially, I went to school. I, I got uh, some really good grades at school, at my school. And the Deptford Green, name of the school, secondary school. And then uh, I actually chose to work straight out of school. So everyone else did what's called A-levels, which is kind of like the first, second year of college. Well, actually, it's more like, it's more like high school, actually. Um, so everyone was doing that, and I was working, so I got to work in Barclays Bank. Okay. I was working in a branch, just a cashier type role. And uh, one day we had like an issue with some of our computers, and I'd just always been interested in computers. I'd, even since my stage school days, I'd just broken down my Amstrad, which was an early type of computer that I had, and the Commodore 64, and I'd go into MS-DOS and fix stuff and mess around with it. And so I just fixed it, I fixed this issue I had. And my line manager was like, Michael, what did you do? I was like, I just fixed the, the, the cashier computers were all messed up. They just had like a Trojan horse in them. I got rid of it and I purged it and I put the MS-DOS 3.2 file in. We were gonna call like the engineers at one church or place is the name of the head up, one CP to come and fix it. I was like, yeah, I just fixed it. So she told someone, a few people, and they go around and I used to help people with little things. And so I'm maybe 16 at the time. I remember, I just left school, got pretty good grades. Mm -hmm. Everyone else is doing these A-levels. Mm -hmm. They're all still in school. Right. I'm working. And uh, just one day, I was like, um, <laughs> gotta remember, in this branch, there's all these people, 50, 20 years in the bank, 30 years in the bank, same job, mm. paying their mortgages with it. And I'm just going around, I'm just like asking questions about things. Why does this, how does it, don't ask questions, don't, no. Right. And I was like, this is strange. It's like everyone's in a bubble here. And then we got to meet the regional director for the whole region of South England all the branches, like a thousand branches. And then to my manager's horror, I started asking this guy systems questions when we met him. And then he was answering them. And then like within a couple of weeks, I got offered a job at um, head oh, office. Wow, yeah. And basically I was working what's called the property risk control unit. I can't believe this is how things shook out, but I was working in this place where we regulated mortgage products in 2007, the beginning of 2007. So you're why the recession happened. Cool, cool. So I'm working at this place and I'm learning the road. And it was, it was like an uh, intellectual jump. And I'm like, and I sat there and I did this full time for maybe like three months. And then I actually asked them to go part time. Because I realized like in this space, everyone had a degree. And even people would meet me and I, I looked a lot older than I was at the time. Like I've always been this size. I'm like, they're like, oh, where did you go to university? I didn't, I just got out of secondary school. And I was like, so I felt, a bit of a societal need for a degree. So I actually, um, 
I started looking around at different schools, and they were like, where's your A-levels? What A-levels did you get? So I didn't, I didn't do A-levels. I'm like, well, we can't let you into university. I was like, oh, that's strange. So I kept doing this with lots of schools, and I found eventually a college called Oxbridge College in Oxfordshire. And um, this is like a really good college. And initially they said that to me, and I was like, I'm really tired of this, just give me an aptitude test. They're like, if you fail this aptitude test and it goes on your UCAS score, you're never going to get into a university. I don't care, just give me the aptitude test. And I got 90% on it. Wow. And then like, they let me in. So now it was the equivalent of an associate's degree. So now I'm doing an associate's degree on one side of London, and I'm working in Canary Wharf on the other side of London two and a half days a week. And so my days just got like insane. But it also opened up this whole part of my mind that I'd never been able to access before. Like, I started linking up the products that we used to create there were called ABS CDOs, which, yeah, they did start the mortgage prices. And they're basically layers of tranches of mortgages that are bedded out to different places. And the math that you use to do that is called linear mathematics. Very simple linear mathematics, just like straight linear line. And then the way you vary it is non-linear mathematics. So, like, there'll be, like, mortgage layer one, mortgage layer two, mortgage layer three and there'll be slices of those mortgage layers and you bet them against each other in these mm, multiple tranches. Package them up, right. sell them off as a higher rate. Well, yeah. Right. Yeah. And, but then I realized something like um, leverage moments within physics, which I was learning about on my computer science degree, had a mathematical application to vary the risk on mortgage tranches. So if you had like multiple layers of a mortgage tranche and they were all high risk, like uh, a CCC or a BBB, and they were all packed into the, they all packed to look AAA from an um, insurance perspective, if you took the risk of the top section and the top sliver of those mortgage payouts, the ones that were most stable, and you offset them against the ones that were also more stable than them, and you cross-referenced them, you could create a stable mortgage product. And I brought that to my boss one day. I said, how did you figure this out? I was like, I'm doing a computer science degree at the same time as this. And so my job evolved from like mortgage application type stuff to programming. Okay. But my title stayed the same and my salary stayed the same. I was just happy to have a part-time job paying me. Like, the amount of money I was getting. So all that happened, and then, and then the recession came in September 2007, dude. And I think, I mean, everyone knew how bad it was, but when you were in the industry, it felt like an avalanche. Insurance companies were covering for the banks, who were covering for physical assets, who were covering for bonds, government bonds, who were then devaluing those bonds, who were devaluing monetary policy, who was devaluing actual GDP, who was devaluing food, it felt like the world was gonna end. Yeah. And everyone else didn't really realize this. So all that happens, and I got laid off from that job afterwards, and then like, I just took like three months to recover, like just yeah. chilling. It's funny because I remember I was like at rock bottom one day, and my dad just comes in, and he has this package, and he puts it on the table, and it's green cards for all of our family. So my uncle, um, who lives in Florida, had applied for green cards for us years back, mm -hmm. and they came. Wow. Yeah. At this moment when I was, at the time, unemployed, and my sister was in a bad place emotionally, my mom was in a bad place emotionally, my dad was working, but he's working in the NHS. I don't know if you know anything about the NHS, but it's the nationalized healthcare system. And it's amazing, because we have nationalized healthcare, but the salaries are low, and there's a lot of pressure. Mm -hmm. So. This is happening, so we're all ready to just leave England forever. Right. Like, so then that gave me this new hope, and I took this job up in an uh, in investment banking consultancy. It was basically like a recruitment company, but like dressed up as a technology company, and I did that just to get some money to take care of a few things. And then my dad took retirement, and then just we just like didn't tell anyone. We booked the flights to my uncle's house, and we just bounced wow. one day, right? And I remember this distinctly because this was a massive life event. I remember I had one suitcase, the rest of our family had suitcases. Our house was in repossession, like it was about to be repossessed. And it's like 1 a.m. and we're all just like walking out the door, going down the stairs, and we're going to a cab to Heathrow Airport. And I remember that distinctly because like, I, you know when you know something is big but it doesn't feel big? Like, I remember like, life is never gonna be the same after this. And so we get on, we land at my uncle's house, and dude, like, I've been to the States maybe once or twice before, but I'm on this plane, it's sunny, it's Miami, we land. <laughs> I've met my uncle maybe once or twice, he pulls up in an Escalade, <laughs> like, we get in this Escalade. I, I've been to his house when I was younger as well, but you remember but you know, things, you're not you know, conscious right. of what, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
it's like, oh, we got this. Is it it? Nah. This dude has like a ridiculous house. And I'm sleeping in this amazing bedroom, and it's like, whoa, I never, ever, ever, for any earthly reason, want to go back to England. Yeah. Wow. And so me and my dad were sleeping in one bedroom, and me and my sister were sleeping in another bedroom, and my uncle was putting us up. And then we sorted out socials, we did this, and it was just a very pressured time. But it felt amazing, though. It felt like a land of new opportunity. It did. Yeah. Did your parents have a plan, like, once the, green, once the green cards came, did like, all right, we, like, the uncle kind of set up some jobs, or what was the plan once you guys landed? Like, came here. That's a great question, LaDonte, and a source of a great deal of conversation in our family. No, not really. Um, but yes, they told us that they did. <laughs> <laughs> but we just all wanted to bounce, really. Like, you gotta understand, like, English culture, American culture is racist, obviously, but, but, and classes, and all the different isms. But English culture is like all of those things with a paradigm double switched on its head. And I'd gotten to a place in it where I'd basically reached the roof. Like, you know, you go on my Instagram, there's Uxbridge put me in their magazine, like, met the royal family, all these different things that I'd done, graduating early, Barclay, all this stuff. Like, by all of those standards, I should have, Maybe this is my hubris, maybe it's my ego, I don't know. Being recognized more, being able to achieve more, my, my family situation should have changed more. And I always wondered why that was never the case. And the classism in England is very interesting because it's, it's conciliary in that it requires you to voluntarily put forth an understanding of the culture to then denigrate yourself. So what I mean by that is, in America, as black men, there's all these different horrible things that happen to us. Yes, absolutely. But you can take that suffering and you can parlay into like a media platform or whatever. Like British culture is so reserved that the moment you do that, other black people are going to sit on you like, what are you doing? Mm. Like, this is black excellence and we don't show our suffering. Now, you take Barack Obama and like talking about his upbringing, talking about his mother, he used all these points of suffering as a way to elevate and like, Leverage. Right. Yeah. And that's the thing, you know, that's the big thing for me, which is why I appreciate, you know, with all the shit that's happening in this country, like, and black culture in this country, mm -hmm. because it's, as much as it can be, it's uplifting, right? It, it, it's reinforcing. And so anyway, so that, that happens, and so, you know, get to the States, I found a job, I'll cut some of this and get to the import bus, like, found a job, my parents actually ended up going home, my dad couldn't get a license, my sister went home, I was in Florida by myself for six months, working, I was like, you know, they need help. So I went back, um, I found a job at an insurance company, and initially as an admin assistant, and this is went key, back to the UK. I went back to the UK. And so when I'd actually graduated, even with all my grades and stuff, like, I couldn't find a real computer science job because there were none. So I, and when I came back, I just needed to find a job to support myself until we could move back, right? So I took an admin assistant job at this company called Aon, insurance company. And this admin assistant job was basically to transpose a bunch of papers into Excel spreadsheets, which I scanned and made a 10-line piece of VBA code to do and started getting coffees. So then, like, I ended up working in what's called the data control unit, yeah. which was basically, like, a place where they were trying to reconcile um, Basel and some of these new regulatory standards with the old-school nature of the insurance industry and lots of data collecting and data transposing and everything else. And I really got to like use my computer science skills there. But long story short, like it was Aon, and then like, that came to a conclusion after like three years. I was there as a senior manager. That, by the time I left, one of the only people to occupy the role. And then I took those skills and I translated them to Viacom, where I was a senior product manager, and then NBC, where I was also a senior product manager. I was only NBC for a short time, like, but it was one of the most senior roles I had. Basically, I was responsible for a <clears throat> technology in relation to and to Jimmy Fallon's show, um, SNL and Seth Meyers, all the transcoding and encoding around that. But I started Film Funder from the very simple notion that I was in the room when a big, big director pitched Empire to people at NBC, mm -hmm. and they turned it down because he couldn't quantify it with numbers. Wow. Big director. And then, like, I was like, this isn't right. And then uh, I wanted to also, like, I linked that to the student storytelling yeah. aspect. So, like, for instance, there's about 1.5 million film students in the US who've done different projects. But it's really hard for them to get their projects financed at a commercial level because they can never quantify things like you know, the CPM of how much the film is actually going to make from an advertising perspective 
or like the production throughput spend and they don't talk about waterfalls, which is just the process of paying for different parts of a film. They don't talk about any of that. So Film Funder was originally made to basically like make all of that automated so that then like, you know, you could have, as a filmmaker, you could walk into Paramount and be like, I'm doing the same thing as an agency or like all these other guys have done, make my film. Very rich people and large advertising departments are relying on machines to make decisions about people instead of making them themselves. So as soon as you introduce human thought to machine learning driven decision making, then some of that gets reduced a little bit more. So like, you know, before we move into sentiment, the one thing that really got for me about that is I read a white paper from HBR about these kids on the south side of Chicago and how in all the uh, media placements that they were seeing was negative images of black people and it directly correlated with shooting crimes and college dropout rates and school dropout rates. Like, they geofenced where the ads were being shown on the south side and at the heart of that is where there were the highest college dropout rates shooting and everything else. So long story short, like, when these young black men were seeing negative images of themselves, they were playing now in real life. And that's because someone at a macro level saw, oh, well, yeah, Freddy Wapid River is great for the south side of Chicago, and that makes us the dollars that we need to ROI rise, but how is that affecting people? Right, right. So that was the original brainchild. And then um, after I got to a point about mid-2016 where I was like, yeah, this isn't working, like, I have no revenue and whatever. I was still, I was, most of my lifestyle, I'd had enough money or I'd saved up enough money, like, I was still, my lifestyle hadn't suffered, but I could see the horizon of where it would start to. And I was like, okay, cool. I'm probably just going to go back and do a job. So, like, you know, I worked very briefly for KBS, which is an agency. And then I worked for Prio, which is this pretty interesting um, kind of thing. And then the company got bought and uh, I didn't have any equity. Then after that happened, I was like, right, I'm going to double down on being an entrepreneur. If I have to sleep under a bridge, like, this is what I'm going to do. And so at the time, I was at the initial stages of a, a, a PhD, super initial stages, and uh, I'd done like formulatory research. And basically the idea was experimental psychology, which is something I do today, which is semantic selectivity in words, specifically getting at certain parts of the brain. So like, if I say a certain word to you, I know at the resonance of which I say the word and the volume that I can appeal that to. That triggers something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I use that to devastating effect, it's great. Um, but <laughs> but um, that was my research. And, and then I was like, cool, no one's doing this. I'd rather actually provide for myself with this research as opposed to go get into a bunch of PhD debt. So yeah, that's when things took like a, a left turn, really good left turn. My mentors all invested small amounts of money in the company and I was like, I come in. I moved out of my apartment, I moved to my parents' house and I just sat there for like six months with an emotive headset on my head, programming in the dark with my mom looking at me like I was crazy. Um, the initial algorithm that I came up with was a version of what's called the support vector machine where I'd look at the time of how people talk about things and I would use that to timestamp what someone means by something and use that to interpret a word. Turns out they didn't have the scale that I wanted. So then I moved to unsupervised learning, which is, all right, give me a bunch of brain data from like 10, 20 people's brains, and let me figure out the meanings from all those words. Then I get this multiplicitous, what we call feature space enlargement, which is, if this is like all 10 people's brains, all of the meaning of the words are in this brain, like, and it doesn't really mean anything. I was like, no, I actually need to start from the physiological root of how somebody thinks about something. And that gives me a pinpoint for word meaning and then I can expand it from there, right? And so I use this to test on myself, the idea that if I could use volume or some other verbal medium to influence myself and see the brain activity using an emotive, I could take that and I could build better sentiment analysis from a neural network that had that understanding. And that's at the center of what we do, right? It's simply the idea that human physiological data and how a human being thinks about words can inform better sentiment analysis because recursive machine learning can select those words by itself the way a person would. And could you explain sentiment analysis? For yeah, me? so sentiment analysis is simply the idea that you look at words and you understand their meaning from other data sources, right? So like, if I have a book and I have another library of words in terms of the meaning of every single word in that book, I just cross compare them. It's what our brain does when we read. So if I have like, if I know that cat, dog and, and arbitrary are all negative words and I see any of those words, that's a negative word. And so it's just machines doing that. Um, uh, and, and explain that a little bit too. What, what is a recurring neural network? Yeah, so a neural network is just a bunch of stuff that you put in. It learns about things. And then what are called pooling layers, which are what's called cost function inflected. So these are just uh, layers of a thing that learn based on mistakes, same way we do. And then there's an output which comes from that. With sentiment, what are the applications of a neural network? Yeah, so the, the application then became focus groups. 
So focus group market is about $68 billion, right? For $68 billion, about 10% ROI is achieved, so $6.8 billion. Um, so that's agencies going out, spending like $1,000, and they don't even quantify how they made that money back. But it turns out when you add it all up by the end, in terms of what a client actually buys after an agency makes a recommendation, it's about $100 worth of value, right? So you're spending $1,000 to get $100 worth of value. And so that was fine for a while, but now that the digital revolution has come about and you have all these smaller agencies popping up, that all why becomes a problem because, like for instance, you can, with $1,000, do everything that you're doing here. And then someone turns around to a film studio and goes, Ladali just made me a full production film with $1,000. Right, right. What are you doing for one million? So that's when like, all the stuff I've been talking about and the, the history that had built up for the last two years, Sprint were interested in it, NVIDIA were interested in it, IBM were interested in it. In the last six months, I feel like I've spoken to every agency on the planet. We're still trying to even train them. They're all interested, but we're trying to train their mindset to move from, oh, how do I make the most billings to how do I make ROI for my clients? If you take everything away, the main application is ROI, which actually ironically links right back to a lack of bias, because if you have a lack of bias, you achieve more ROI. If you have bias in the first place, you're only going to do stuff that you think makes sense that you've done before and expected to do something different. Without that bias, you try new approaches, you try innovative approaches, and you actually achieve something. Kind of talk about, you know, uh, what's kind of going on with this AI revolution and why it's really important to have you know, people with a lot of different types of experience around the table when you're building these types of products. It's interesting for people of color, this is a very interesting time engineering wise because you don't have to be so over specific in the boys club anymore. If you just understand the specifics of what your area of expertise is, you can become very valuable very quickly and short circuit the whole system. Figure out that you want to be a front end engineer. Cool. Now you're the most valuable front end engineer in New York and you didn't have to go to college to do that. Like, you just had to figure out that you wanted to be a front-end engineer. So, like, that's been very important for, for me, and I did that last year with CCNY Codes. Um, and this is even a side thing. Like, what I just figured out, I figured out last year, and I was like, look, I can't hire, like, someone from Silicon Valley to come over here and help me with this at my level. Like, and I was working, like, 10 hours a day to make this stuff happen. And I was like, I need to find a way to scale my team for all the work that's coming in but I don't have money. I only, like, we've only raised $300,000 to date. Like, and last year it was only 100000 right? So um, I was like, all right, how do we do this? And so I got invited by David to talk at C. And then I went up there and I'm talking to these kids. I'm like, hold on a second. You mean to tell me none of you guys has ever had an internship at any top tech company in New York ever? And there's like 5,000 of you. To answer your bias question, you're absolutely right. Like, if you look in... American history at men of color who've done successful things, they've always been co-opted or hijacked by the establishment and then turned into the opposite of what MLK, Malcolm, like M MLK is in yoga ads right now. Like, so the way I get around that is very simple. And this is something that I think some people miss about me. I have been in corporate environments and I absolutely know how to lower my voice all the way down and cross my legs here and make everyone feel comfortable with eye contact. I deliberately choose not to do that. And the reason that I do that is because when people see me doing that in the most obvious version of being a black man, it creates a precedent for what that means in tech. What do I mean by that? If, if I can, and it is, part of that is because I'm me and I realize that not everyone's me, but like, if I can do that, then there's even a kid named Carlos. I think you guys met Carlos. Like, Carlos is this like super, very demure young man, very talented engineer. By the time he finished working with me, this guy was out here like, he's got an internship at Lockheed Martin right now and he runs around the office like he owns it, right? That's only because he saw me being the most authentic version of myself. No matter how much people would try and beat it down. While still being an expert at your craft. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is the, and I can't emphasize this enough, this is the thing that's been missing in American culture. Like, and I'm sure there's other people who do it. You know, there's people in the main, but for, for whatever reason, like, English black men um, either have been allowed to or decide to do that in American culture. John Boyega, right? Like, um, who else? Uh, Idris Elba, right? Like, Mostly because of our elocution and the fact that we're foreign yet familiar, we're allowed to do that. But if 
if black American culture was able to move in that space, quite a lot of the problems that exist would go away. Simply because, like, all of a sudden, I'm, I'm a shocking experience for some people. I mean, like, I'll be very honest, I, I sit in meetings sometimes and people expect me to be an idiot because I'm so loud, and then I shock them, right? But that dichotomy is how human beings actually exist. Being very frank, like, white people get away with that. And there's no upfront burden about that, right? It's like, if a dude literally walks in in a three-day-year-old shirt and flip-flops on a short in Silicon Valley, he gets funded. Like, but we do that, and it's like, what, what are you doing, right? And I'm not saying that everyone should do that, but we need to at least move to a place where the most authentic version of ourselves is not feared, so that the zeitgeist can move to that same direction. And that's, that's all I do there. And that, that's the second part. And that, that's, the, that's my combating of what you're talking about. But on a more technical level, like, I spent a lot of time engineering-wise figuring out, at least for the programmatic piece, I don't know so much on the focus group piece and some of the other pieces that are a little bit more linear, but on the programmatic piece of our technology, how to ensure that if someone wants to do that, there are rails of control that stop it from happening. And so you saw AT&T bought AppNexus recently, right? Yeah. Um, the reason they bought AppNexus is because they don't understand the programmatic ecosystem, but it's taken over half of their business. Now, with that knowledge, I am a, it's a, just to get, not super technical, but like, essentially what Sentiment does is what's called a data management platform, and it feeds data into what's called um, demand side platforms, which feed data into exchanges like AppNexus, which then show up on your mobile, right? So if the data coming into a demand side platform to make a buying decision has the rails of demographics built into it with human intelligence, the human intelligence on its own can make a non-discriminatory decision, regardless of the parameters that have been set by actual humans. But um, you know, outside of sentiment, I know that's kind of your life's work right now, but what are you passionate about outside of that? Talk a little bit about you know, how you kind of decompress and, and you know, what, what you're passionate about and, and what you funny, do outside of it. I've always written music and rapped and freestyled, but recently I got signed to a record label. Really? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's called Some Place Called Brooklyn. Um, so, so crazy to say, I got like an EP coming out at some point, uh, which will be cool. It's like... Blood in the streets. <laughs> right. right. So, so you know before we wrap this up, like, can we get a 16? Couple bars. Can we get a 16? Actually, actually this is a pretty cool one. You ready, you ready? This is actually from one of my songs. St. Louis to South London, New York to Catford. Anger's disposition, that's a cultural incision. An economic decision, subversion or betrayal. What a decision. Poverty or truth, an economic glass roof, reparations to be paid, words to be lost, mothers to be widowed. English accent or not, white is what I'm not, articulate and floss, no, difference in the eyes of a system to which there is no existence of context of equality, just a placebo of prophecy, those who said temporary freedoms of placidity, for permanent restriction, based temporarily, on an empire of freedom, built to the bottom of our backs, bloodline of colours independent of that, England, Africa, Boston, birthrights irrelevant, one misjudgment, you're just black, and in that moment you get bullied or strangled on your back, that's the meaning of progress? This is the gleaming regress, so stressful you're blessed. Creators power the best. Hip-hop's gifts so exciting. Such a lift and there it comes. Cultural appropriation, stereotypical judgment, negative socialization, violent destruction for those fortunate enough to overcome the odds of a system. Built to destroy them. It's built to destroy them. Escape the mind games of Washington, tuition of Yale, judgment of Gales, existing yet denied in every single employment application made to survive. It's done. Drop one and move, guys! It's Drop one and move, guys! Michael, man, thank you for joining us. Appreciate you for coming on, and um, you know, hopefully we can get you in for part two, my brother. Awesome, awesome, awesome. All awesome. right, man. That was good, man. That was really good. That was good. It's fire. It's fire. That was really good. That was good. It's just it social justice shit on my mixtape, bro. I'm like bringing the theme through. All right, so we got our British brother Mike in the. Mmm. Mmm. Yeah, we should cut the light skin part. <laughs> That's a great question, Ladante. And a source of a great deal of conversation in our family. Thanks for kicking it with us this episode. And if you want to learn more about New Age Capital, check us out at newage.vc. Also, subscribe to our YouTube channel for more dope content.